We're not live on. We are live. live. So we are we live now? I think we should be pretty live on Instagram, Facebook, uh, and YouTube. I think. Uh, so welcome everyone. We're sort of trying a slightly different thing uh, this evening. We've got our core range sort of tasting pack that we sent out. Hopefully, ho most of you have that. Don't worry if you don't have the tasting pack. Go into your cupboard. I'm sure you've got a couple of Kilhomans, or we might say a few things relatively interesting along the way that you, even if you don't have a, a Kilhoman, you might enjoy. Uh, but yeah, we've got the core range, and it mostly will be about the, the whiskies there, the Maccabay first, then the San Egg, 100% Ida, and Lock Form is the order we'll taste them in. Uh, but th what we thought we'd do is a, a bit of a food pairing as well. So we've got some charcuterie here, um, and we'll go through a bit of food pairing after the whiskies. It's really just a to show that whiskey can be paired with food and some great ingredients work together. And although whiskey gives off certain aromas, certain flavors, uh, great then uh, charcuterie here works very well with Kilhoven. And we wanted to pair up with Scottish producers of food. So over the next few weeks, few months, we'll pair up with different producers. This is venison, but we're pairing up with uh, some island cheese, some uh, West Coast seafood producers next month, I think is gear halibut. So we'll be trying to do different producers from around Scotland that, that work well with, with Kilhoman. Uh, but James knows a little bit more about yeah. the food side yeah. of things than I do. So. Do I? Well, it's amazing. <laughs> That's what you're talking um, about. Yeah. So um, this evening, we're, we're pairing the whiskies with um, charcuterie from the uh, Great Glen charcuterie. So um, this is uh, venison, wild venison charcuterie. Um, venison, if you're not familiar with with the phrase venison, it is it is uh, deer. It's uh, typically red deer, I believe, and um, this is all sourced and and created, put together by the great people at, at Great Glen, um, Jan and Anya. There's a it's a family run business. They've been going for for 15 years, I believe, and charcuterie in general pairs really well with with whiskies, but um, venison. In particular, it, it's quite a distinct flavor, it's quite a distinct character, it's very rich, um, it's quite herbaceous, it's very, very um, distinctive, as I say. So it pairs quite well with Kilhoman because of that that big smoky influence that we have with our whiskies. So um, yeah, I mean, as Pete said, best thing to do is, is going to be to taste the whiskies first and then taste the, the char charcuterie, but um, you know, do whatever you feel it comes naturally. I would say neither of us are very good cooks, so we, we don't know. Yourself. Well, Tess has told me, but yeah, we, we neither of us are, are terrific chefs, so we know more about whiskey certainly than we do about food. So we'll, we'll be focusing on that. But those, I think, forty odd of you uh, did pick up the uh, charcuterie and some of the food. So we'll we'll talk a bit about the food pairing. Uh, but of course, uh, some of the main things is the whiskey and uh, Kilhoman. For those who are fairly new to it, I'm sure most of you do know Kilhoman, but you know, we, we started in 2005. We are a, a farm distillery on Isla, uh, on the west coast of the island. And uh, we've got a, a fairly small range in terms of the core range of whiskies. And we'll be tasting all those this evening and hopefully telling you all about the distillery and, and what we get up to. But I think with most whiskey tastings, the best thing to do is, is start by tasting a whiskey. So uh, the first one in the lineup is the, the Maccabay. And hopefully those who've got the uh, tasting pack would have got their, their Maccabay dram. And this is really our sort of core range, our, our main tram, if you will, that was released back in 2012. And there we go. This is it. Well done, James. Thank you. Well done. Uh, it was released back in 2012, and it was our first whiskey that was really always available. So before then, it had been small releases, limited releases, seasonal releases, where we were really trying to find our way in the industry back in 2009, 10, 11, where we didn't really know what worked with our cast. We were maturing in next bourbon, maturing next sherry, long finishes, short finishes, not really knowing what the best route was for, for Kilhoman. But we ended up with the Macca Bay here as, as finding our, our main launch pad, really, for our, our, our sort of flagship Kilhoman, if you want to say it like that. Uh, and what it is is 90% ex bourbon cast and 10% ex sherry cast maturation. Kilhoman is a sort of, I guess, mostly ex-bourbon matured whiskey. We fill 80%, roughly 70, 80% into ex-bourbon barrels. And then uh, most of the other remaining is into ex-oloroso sherry. And obviously, the, you know, we do a, a few 
experimental gas around that, whether it's port, Madeira, it's a term which some of you might have seen. But, but back to the Maccabea, this is 46% uh, ABV. We don't go below that. All our whiskey is non chill filtered, natural color. So as you see them in the bottle, the, the glass, the only influence on that has been the wood, the cask has given it that color. We don't add any coloring. You might see some of the bigger distillers out there who want to add a bit of caramel coloring so that it's all uniform color throughout you know, every release they ever have. And, and we don't want that. We like the differences of variation. Sane, James will talk a bit later about Sane where there's big, bigger variations there because it's ex sherry cast mature. But the Maccabe, you can see the color is reasonably light because it's mostly ex ex bourbon cast matured and you know when you bring it to your nose there it's some of that ex vanilla some ex bourbon but it's actually a lot of the kilhoman character which is citrus lemon fresh fruit fresh smoke but it's not too heavily peated although we're an isla distillery uh, and we are a heavily peated sort of uh, malt that we use we use 50 ppm malts in this uh, particular bottling Similar to, I guess, our bag, like in those heavily peated Irish sort of earthy sort of uh, TBC sort of, you know, uh, medicinal smoke you get through there. But the way we produce it, small stills, a long fermentation to bring through that fruit, it doesn't come through with the same sort of power of smoke. It is a, a bit more gentle on them. Yeah, sort of a gentle, light smoke to it. And that's the same on the palate. You'll get a little bit more smoke coming through on the palate when you do drink it. But it's, it's still not a, a real sort of powerful, earthy sort of back of the throat smoke. It's a light, gentle peak to it. And it's, uh, I'd say really that, that fruit is something that, not just Maccabay, but across all Kilomans, you'll get that real fruity, fresh feel to it. And, and Maccabay sums that up pretty well. Um, but there's also that, there's a bit of that, the peatiness comes through, but it's also, it has that earthiness, that richness naturally with the peat, yeah. which lends itself, any of these whiskies lend themselves to, um, you know, a, a relatively rich pairing. Maccabay is a bit on the lighter side, isn't it? Yeah. 10% 10, 10 sherry, so it gives a little bit of that richness, a little bit of that extra sort of oomph to it, but it, it is, yeah, slightly lighter than, than some of our other releases. But um, the Maccabay, if you've ever been to Isla as well, I don't know if some of you have been to Isla or were planning to come to Isla, obviously not at the moment. Uh, we built a nice visitor centre for you, though, actually in, uh, in February we had a nice big launch of our new visitor centre, but unfortunately no visitors have been to Isla since. So uh, hopefully that, that is opening up soon and we can welcome a few of you over to Isla in the not too distant future. Uh, but Maccabay, Bay, if you come to visit Kilhoma, just down the road is beautiful beach, quite famous on the island. Uh, and that's what we named our, our general release after it. So it's a fairly beautiful place. I would say though, it's pretty cold on Isla most of the year in the, in the sea. And uh, I wouldn't recommend swimming, uh, but I would recommend having a, a drama Mackey Bay while you're down there it might be worthwhile. And James and I are actually part of the uh, sales marketing, well, most of the sales marketing department at Kilhoven, and we uh, weren't too inventive. So you may notice the theme as we go through the whiskey tonight of Mackey Bay, Sané, Uh They're all things you can pretty much see out the window at Kilhoven. So if it fits on the bottle and it's near enough, we tend to, tend to call the whiskey after it. There's not many reasons apart from that, but uh, uh, local landmarks tend to be what we, we name Good whiskey. Enough, really. Good enough. If you've been to Maccabay, Bay, you'll, you'll know it's a good enough region. It's a beautiful, beautiful beach. Um, what, four or five miles of yeah. sand. It's not that long, I don't know. I don't know if you're, it's it's quite long. It's about miles, isn't it? It's definitely, not, it's it's definitely not four or five, anyway. I think it'll be a couple of miles at least. Yeah, maybe a few chunk of it. <laughs> um, but to, to bring it to the food uh, and, and to the charcuterie we've got here, the uh, venison here, we've got uh, uh, venison chorizo. <laughs> We actually Googled beforehand how you pronounce chorizo and we saw chorizo, 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 if you're trying to be particularly Spanish, but we ended up with just sticking to chorizo, we probably won't make us look too stupid. So uh, when you're food pairing, I would obviously recommend having the whiskey first and getting a real feel for the taste and the flavours that come through. As I said, a lot of citrus, a bit of vanilla, uh, sort of light smoke, saltiness coming through there. And that's really what the, the vendors and chorizo brings through. It's got, yes, Typical venison is a, quite a powerful meat, to be honest. It's earthy, it's rich. But where this works a bit with the Maccabay is more the sage, lighter side where, you know, due to the diet of, of venison, of deer, you know, some of that sage, some of that eucalyptus, some of that lemon, citrus notes do come through as well as that rich, earthy side. And that's more what we're trying to capture here in the Maccabay, and that does work. So I'd get used to the whiskey, understand the whiskey by drinking first, but 
take a little bite of the charcuterie uh, and the oil is also in here when you drink should should coat the palate and, and be a really good mix and i would say generally speaking all these you know uh, different ones we've got venison we've got chili venison some pork some salami they all work well with the kilhomans and you know we paired them with four individual whiskies but on the whole you know you can mix and match swap and change you know we're not saying this is exactly the one for Mackey Bay, but just what we felt worked best. So I think you can, um, you can, yeah, what you want to do, I think, is is get a good grasp of the whiskey. So two or three sips at least. Um, get a good feel for the character, the flavors that are coming through from from the, the whiskey first, and then have a bite of, of the meats and, uh, and see. And if you're not, if you don't have the meats, then um, get a very yeah. good feel for the whiskey. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But you can also, I mean, you could also open up a separate tab and, and check out the, the guys um, yeah. from Great Glen and, and they're still running that 10% discount for the for the packs as well. So um, yeah, really if you're getting very jealous at home, not having yeah. the charcuterie, then yeah, I think they still, still have the, the pack of these four on, yeah. on sale for you so you can you can have a go. But but yeah, generally speaking, Maccabee is our, our main release. And, as I mentioned, we, we're not a huge producer in terms of the size of production. We produce around about, I think it was last year, sort of 300,000 litres of alcohol, roughly, uh, which might sound like quite a lot. But when you compare that to the other distilleries around Scotland, but even just on Isla, you know, the next biggest is, you know, doing, you know, around about a million litres. And then you go right the way up to Kalila, who does our yearly production in about 10 days or so. So we're very much at the smaller end of it. And we never were built to compete in terms of size and how much whiskey we can produce. That was never the aim. When my, our father started Kilhoman back in 2005, the aim was always quality and trying to produce something different. And that was to be a farm distillery, to grow some of the malt on the farm, to malt it ourselves, to mature it, distill it, bottle it all on site as a, as a farm distillery uh, and, and produce on a sort of small scale, really hands on. And, and that's why we only have two whiskies that are always available, Mackey Bay and, and then Sané, which James will talk about in just a second, where these are the only whiskies available throughout the year. All the other releases are limited in some way, whether we do them every year or just one-offs. They're, they're limited in the amount. So, so that's sort of our ethos. And um, yeah, on you go, James. Your turn. <laughs> Go on. I just thought so to give you give you a bit of an update on on what's happening, I guess, on on Isla and um, Kilhoman. Uh, we have obviously sown our barley, so. Um, Part of the sort of yearly cycle is is well underway, and and that barley is coming along pretty nicely. It enjoyed some some warmer weather um, in sort of May June time. It, it's a bit chillier, a bit more mixed weather now, but uh, the barley is coming along nicely. Um, we're hoping to reopen the visitor center in a couple of weeks. I don't want to preempt any announcements that we're going to make because I'll probably give the wrong information. But that's going to be reopening, um, and so um, yes, yeah, I. I been over there for the last three months and now I'm back here but um all's well on Isla and uh we yeah, should mention to... we're in the Edinburgh yeah. office fairly small office where pretty much just us work from but um yeah. we're there at the moment if uh if anyone's confused by surroundings and we thought we wouldn't normally sit this close to each other but yeah. you know we wouldn't fit on the screen otherwise and we're we're living in the same house at the moment so yeah unfortunately yeah <laughs> not bunking up we're in the same house yeah Anyway, so the, the Maca Bay, um, we're going to monitor any questions that are coming in, but there seems to be a lot of praise for the, um, for the this was the venison chorizo, yeah? Yeah, so then. lots of praise for that really rich, um, you know, oily character that pairs, you know, very well with the, with the Maca Bay. Yeah, and then the chorizo has a little bit of spice, I think that sort of, you know, enhances uh, some of the flavors in here with that sort of salty smoke fruit with spice it all all works pretty well so and i think um, the, the citrus of the citrus that carries through particularly with the mac and then later when we taste the 100 percent isla that real citrus sweetness floral character of, of the kilhoman whiskey really cuts through that you know sometimes quite sort of a uh, big bold character of, of the venison so um yeah should we taste the sammy i think so um Put that in there just one time. So Sanig, um, I'll swap these out. Sanig is our um, core expression. So it's, I always sort of describe it as the sister whiskey of, of Maca Bay. It's, um, it's also regularly available. It's all, always available. Um, 
and it's also a combination of bourbon and sherry cask maturation. However, you might be able to tell from the color of the bottle there, uh, I can't get on both screens, or the, the whiskey, um, if you have it in your glass, much, much darker, richer color. And that's coming uh, from the sherry cask. So this is, is about 70% sherry cask matured. Maccabay, 90% bourbon cask. So this is kind of the opposite end of the, of the spectrum. Darker color, richer flavor. And this really um, will pair beautifully with, with any of these um, chorizos or, or salami. Lovely, lovely, rich, fruity. In this case, slightly oaky as well, because Maccabay is, as I said, mostly bourbon cask, San Egg, mostly sherry cask. The sherry casks we use are, are Oloroso sherry. So it's a kind of medium, medium dry sherry. Um, the Oloroso cask, you know, the specific type of cask that we use for San Egg is mostly Oloroso hogsheads. These are slightly smaller than, than other Oloroso casks. So it means you get a bit of oaky um, kind of spiciness coming through as well. So we paired this with the, what is it exactly? Hold on. Uh, you didn't read up. I was actually <laughs> doing it professionally and went off and tasted it earlier. Yeah. the clue. I feel like I'm obscure my notes again, so you can't see that really. Um, I paired, we paired this with the with the venison and pork chorizo. So the reason we did that is because, to my mind, the, uh, the San Egg and any sherry matured whiskey um, from Kilhonan has a real sort of savoury barbecue sauce, sweetness, porky, uh, barbecued ribs kind of kind of influence coming through, whether it's San Egg, which is slightly oakier, as I said, or um, Loch Gorm, which we're going to try later, which is a is a bit more fruity, juicy. Um, either one of those sherry maturations is going to pair beautifully with any really rich food. So um, we, as I say, we paired this with the with the venison and with that pork because it just it's a little bit lighter, adds to that fruitiness of of the San Egg, and as Pete said, you know, um, I don't know whether you're taking, you're saying you're not very creative or we're not very creative, but well, San Egg is also a chef. just a landmark near Kilhoman. Oh, and um, yeah, so I say just a landmark. It's, it's a, quite a spectacular sort of rocky outcrop that juts out into the Atlantic and on a on a big weather day on, on either, it's, it can be yeah, I think, quite I think special. For me, the, the, the San Egg and the Matthew Bay are, so are two core expressions which sit side by side you know, wherever we're going, what our father think, wanted to show is cast maturation. So, of course, you know, we're huge experience of barley type, barley variety. We'll talk a bit later with the Hunters and I about all that side of things. But with these two, what's so interesting to try them side by side, like this in a, in a tasting, is that they're the same malt. So, you get some malt from Portella Maltings, we grow some ourselves. So, this malt from Portella Maltings at 50 ppm, so the peating level of the malt, uh, it's then Distilled in the same way, it's uh, bottled at the same strength. So, it effectively, it's exactly the same spirit. The only difference is the cast types that's matured. And it's roughly the same age as well, both average out around about five years old, although they're non age statement whiskies. You know, we're not, you know, backwards and coming forwards about the age. You know, we're quite happy to tell everyone that it, it averages around about five years old. But what's so interesting is how important the cast influence is. You can probably see straight away from the color. Uh, you know how different they are, but also the character and the taste and the sort of DNA of the whiskey is the same. They both got that real fruit forward feel. Uh, but whereas with Matthew Bay, it was citrus, lemon, real fresh fruit with the extra Oloroso sherry influence in the Sane, you're now getting more of that, yeah, richer, darker, sort of maybe raisins, uh, a little bit of spice from the Oloroso sherry. So it's just adapting so much to whiskey in only five years of age. It shows how important cask influence can be. And, and that's why we try our best to source the best cast we can. Our fresh bourbons from Buffalo Trace in America, our sherry from uh, Miguel Martin in, in Spain, um, and, and try and get the best cast because they do make such a big difference to the whiskey. And it's not that you know uh, a great cast is going to change a, a spirit completely and make it a great whiskey. It's just focusing on each stage of the production, try and make sure your barley is correct, but then you're malting right and you're distilling the way you want and you're fermenting the way you want and, and the cask is, is an important part of, of that whole process. So yeah. um, that really shows it in these two whiskies how different you can get and how much influence can come through just from just from the cask it's matured in. Yeah. And did you I didn't know I wasn't completely paying attention to you, but you mentioned the cask influence of San Egg 70%. Something. 
No? It's about 70%. Yeah, yeah. it's about 70%. We so use, it's a combination of, of maturation and finishing, isn't it? So it's, it's not quite as a sort of, I don't want to say precise recipe as Macadé, because Macadé is, is basically nine bourbon barrels, one sherry cask, essentially. So 90% bourbon, 10% sherry. With the San Egg, it's a little bit more um, complicated in some ways because some of that sherry influence is, is coming from full maturation, but also some of the, the sherry influence is coming from finishing of bourbon barrels. So, um, you know, that's why we say cask influence. You know, if you see the packaging, it says cask influence on the, on the front and it gives a, a bar showing the, the influence of the bourbon and the sherry. Um, but yeah, big. And, so and I, I'd say like heavy hitting sherry, but it's, it's refined. It's actually, there's not like the, the sweetness people expect from sherry. It's rich, it's fruity. Yeah. And we do have to say uh, a special mention to uh, Ross Brearley and, and Jennifer, yeah. who uh, were supposed to be married this year, but unfortunately uh, it, it can't happen, obviously due to the current situation and uh, the coronavirus. So uh, I believe he's a huge fan of Gilhoven and the top table was actually going to be called Kilhoman after wow. his, uh, and he's a particular fan of Sanic. So we so, thought at this point we'd raise a dram and, and cheers to the wedding, which is no longer Ross, this year, but Jennifer. next year. Uh, yeah, to, to Ross and Jennifer, and, and uh, congratulations on the, the marriage. And I'm sure you'll sure, 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 yeah. Yeah, get it done, just maybe, yeah. maybe later than planned. Anyway, cheers. Yeah, so, um, yeah and, it, and it matches again well with, with, yeah. with, with all the, the charcuterie coming in. and um, and I would say, yeah, also, you know, any questions that anyone has on the whiskeys, Isla, what we might get up to or, or anything, uh, feel free to fire them in on social media. We're trying to keep track as we can on, on the phone here of, of questions that come in. Um, but yeah, we, we uh, do these tastings every so often at the moment and uh, we're going through our, our core range here and the next one up is, is 100% Isla. And this is sort of our... Uh, really reason for being a distillery we'll go into a bit more depth worry about the distillery now uh that we're before we try this whiskey but kilhoman is a, is a farm distillery this is a what we call a single farm single malt so when we started kilhoman in 2005 um the idea really was to produce as much homes and island as we could you know you say we you we think, you think could I? yes you're about 16 at the time weren't you? uh i was 15 <laughs> or 16 but i like to think my dad took a lot of advice from me personally <laughs> Uh, I worked, started working for Kilhoman before you did, so I actually have more depth knowledge. Let's not get into it. <laughs> we can just start, <laughs> start arguing on screen. Uh, but, uh, but no, the, the hundred and Isla is, yeah, really our, our sort of reason for being. We wanted to produce as much of this style, be a farm distillery, uh, you know, grow the barley. We grow about 200 tonnes, 250 tonnes roughly on the farm at the moment. Uh, we then malt it on site, four tonnes every week. We're malting by hand. Uh, uh, at the distillery, with them distilling it, maturing it, and bottling but on site. So this whiskey really, you know, travels about 200 yards from the field all the way to the bottle. Uh, every process at Kilhoman, and you know, we're the only ones on Isla to, to produce whiskey, you know, from the barley field all the way through to the bottle uh, on one site. Uh, and it, it's something we're pretty proud to make, to be honest. And um, it is done hands-on as well. So in floor, although they're not delighted by it, it is wheelbarrows and it's shovels and it's churning it around that way even in the still house it's cranked by hand you know some of the bigger distilleries you know for efficiency purposes it's it's you know automated and a couple of people can tap a few buttons and it's done that way but we're doing it in quite a traditional way and that was really our father's i guess you know real passion what he wanted to achieve was a, a traditional farm distillery you know 100 years ago this was sort of how whiskey was produced all over Ireland. 150 years ago you know 20 30 distilleries all small scale Crofters who would grow some barley, excess barley would be made to uh, made into whiskey, into spirit, and 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 that's how whiskey sort of came to be on Isla, and, and that was sort of lost along the way as whiskey became this big international product and sold you know, commercially all around the world. Distilleries grew up and up and up, and the small farm distilleries sort of died away. So Kilhoman is really a bit of a throwback to how whiskey used to be made, and and the Hunters and Isla is, is a perfect example of that, where it's all on one farm, single farm, single malt start to finish. So the major difference between this and the, the Port Allen malt that we get in from Port Allen maltings on Isla is that the peating level is different. So Hunters and Isla is peated at 20 ppm instead of 50, so a little bit lighter in terms of the peating level. Uh, and also the malt we grow. So we grow different barley varieties. We started 
back in 2005 we sort of optic barley then we moved to publican we've grown sassy concerto octavia so we've grown a number of different varieties of barley and you know initially we were probably a bit naive and thinking you know it's mostly about yield and we can you know grow some barley and we can do it that way but over time what we've seen is actually the barley variety can make a, a really quite big difference in terms of the character and taste you get from the spirit so you know this year well, this year or last year was the first year we actually really split the barley varieties separately and, and distilled them separately and really found that there was a different character coming through on on the taste i think if anyone joined us for fresh yield and the tasting uh, that was done there with different barley varieties you can really see the difference coming through and that's what we're now really quite passionate about really is what varieties come through what flavor and the next edition of hundreds and Island will have on it what barley varieties were grown that year for that release so that you can you know include that in what i guess the transparency of it what it was grown by and follow it all the way through i think it's the thing with with, with making whiskey um is that it's it's not about a single thing is it? It, it there are a lot of parts and processes that go into uh contributing how a whiskey tastes so that goes right the way back to the field and the barley varieties that we grow and with the 100 percent isla you know we can control every single part of that process so we control them you know the the varieties that we choose to sow and and these days it's mainly con concerto barley um we do as pete said you know experiment a bit but we we control that that variety of barley we control the malting we control the peating level where the peat is cut how it's cut how long it's smoked for all of these parts of the process that you know other distilleries and even you know for for Maccabay and, and Sane, you know we we don't have the same control for Maccab uh, sorry sorry for the 100 percent island we can really go into all of the detail on that and um, and it's been a real um, education hasn't it over the last sort of 15 yeah. years how you know subtle changes affect um you know the quality the quantity all different aspects of the whiskey yeah. um, so with 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 the ability to do it all yourself you know you you have that that level of control yeah. that other people don't because we certainly we certainly wouldn't pretend that our barley we grow on the farm that Kilhoman is the best quality malting barley you get you know it certainly isn't you know, that's the reason why people buy it from elsewhere around scotland around the uk or even abroad sometimes because there's better conditions on either it's windy it's wet you know it's not the best soil but we can grow barley we can grow malting barley on isla on kilhoman is pretty fertile soil and we can grow some great barley but it doesn't necessarily get the yield we want so we're not making as much whiskey from the same amount of barley but the quality of the spirit doesn't get changed the the flavor that comes through is different it's not worse if, or better. If, if anything like that you know that the spirit that's created from the barley that's growing on isla is different and that's what people are interested about in. yeah. that's what they they love because it's it's affected by the environment of Isla, and that that's comes through in the whiskey. Yeah, exactly. And we have probably bored you now talking about that, and uh, you're probably waiting to taste the whiskey. We've already there's, finished. There's it. one question. Yeah, uh, there was uh, uh, there was a question about I can't remember who asked the question now, but about which of these whiskies were available in India. Um, it's really just the the Macadé and the Sané at, at the moment. Um, there's a whole whole side yeah. of, of selling whiskey in India, which gets quite quite boring but it's uh, yeah 60 percent tax i think so yeah. a bottle of macabre that costs about 40 40 45 pounds here costs about 120 pounds in yeah. india so uh the other limited releases don't quite get a look in so um so yeah but you can you can find um macabre and sanig and, and our distributor our, our representatives out there are called vault um and they um would be more than happy they they've got a big presence on social media and stuff like that so just search vault all spirits you'll be able to get in touch with them. No? Sorry, yeah. Sales pitch for India. Yeah, we, can, we can talk about whiskey. <laughs> Hello, James. Uh, so, so, yeah, the, the, so 100% island. So, the, as we mentioned, the barley, the, the peating levels lower. And you can sort of get that instantly on the nose where, you know, it is a fresher feel. It's not so much that smoky. Yeah. Although Macabre Sanic weren't big peat monsters, they certainly had a bit of smoke to them. 100% island is that much lighter. It's very floral, isn't it? It's, it's floral, real. It, it's real citrus notes, it's a real fresh smoke as well, it's a real saltiness to it. Um, and, you know, on the pan, it's 50% alcohol as well, so a little bit higher in strength compared to the others at 46. Felt at 50%, it just carried through a bit more weight, a bit more of the character came through on it at 50. Um, so the nose there is very light. On the palate, when you taste this, I'll just taste it. Yeah, taste it. 
you know, I think for me, what's so different for the early ones is how light and it's all ex bourbon cast matured in the ninth edition. Uh, so it's, it's that sort of creamy vanilla sweetness that comes through. There's no sherry influence in the ninth edition of Hunter and Isla. So it's that, yeah, light vanilla a, sort of, sort of influence. There's a bit of like hay, herbaceous -y. Yeah, herby. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I should mention Hunter and Isla is an addition. So for those who didn't get the tasting pack, you may have grabbed a Hunter and Isla from the cupboard and, and we do it in addition. So every year since 2011, I think it was, we've done a new edition. So first, second, third, fourth. Each year, about 12,000 bottles in each edition. And every year really has been a progression of both age and sometimes cast type. Almost always ex-bourbon barrels, but it's gone from three years old to three and a half to four to five to five and a half and, and slowly progressed to this where all the casts are over nine years of age uh, in this whiskey. So it's quite interesting. If you are tasting back at home a fourth or fifth or sixth edition in the cupboard, Really, the only difference is the age of maturation. It's kept mostly ex bourbon. It's always at 50% alcohol. So it's, you can really track how this whiskey has developed over the years purely on the cask influence. And this one, at nine years of age, you're really starting to see the cask take a bit more hold. Early on, when it was three, four, five years old, it was all about fresh citrus, sort of a maltiness, a real malty sort of farmyard feel came through on it. Whereas more as the cask comes in, it's that sort of creamy vanilla, softens it a little bit. Um, but what's, still, what's the age of these? So these are nine years old. Oh, yeah. Why is it not? I'm just going to test you. <laughs> I've already said that. You weren't oh, yeah, listening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I faked that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> hopefully you're not phasing out. I hope. Um, so yeah, so this is... No, and is, and, is, and what's, this is paired And with, this is paired with... So this is a slightly controversial. We had a bit, bit, of, bit of an argument over does this pair or doesn't it pair? You can probably let us know at home. But this is uh, the chilli venison. And it's very much the same as the venison at the start. So... Uh, Macchia Bay was paired with venison. Well, this just has a bit of extra chili, a bit of extra spice, a bit of extra kick to it. Both were smoked, oak smoked, so it has that smokiness to it again, which works quite well with the whiskey. But what we thought with the Mac, uh, sorry, the Hunters and Isla was it's a little bit lighter, fresher feel to it, and a little bit of kick from the uh, mm -hmm. spice actually helps. It brings through, it adds a bit of new dimension to what is a, a light, fresh citrus sort of whiskey with a light bit of salty smoke. and. And it works well. I would say, again, get used to the whiskey, have a few uh, sips, uh, get used to the tones and notes of it, and then have a bite of the, the chili. I, have. I hate spice. <laughs> so actually, I was the one who was sort of more on the edge of this sort of blew my mouth away. But for those who like spicy food, this will probably feel like nothing you know, to them. So I think it's nice. It just, you know, it has, as I said, it has, the 100% Isla has that slightly herbaceous floral sort of top note to it, which is... Um, it, it works. I think it's, yeah. it's nice, and and the smokiness, you know, lends itself to the to the venison in the same way it did, did previously. So it's I think it works pretty well. Ah, uh, we've been see Greg Glenn are watching and uh, loving the uh, the whiskies and the charcuterie. So thanks for and again thank you for uh, providing this and hopefully everyone's enjoying it. Who's having it at home? And apparently, a few people are getting strawberry strawberry in the hundred percent island. Yeah, well, certainly, so, uh, I, yeah. certainly fresh fruit and perhaps it's, yeah. it's that mix between. The ex bourbon cast, that sort of vanilla sweetness coming through, and the fresh fruit from our natural spirit, that combination that's, that's giving that strawberry. Uh, I think more on the nose, way. more on the nose maybe than the palate, but, but yeah, now you say yeah. strawberry, I'm getting strawberry. And when we're up, we've been asked about, uh, about the water as well. You know, with all our whiskies, you're, you're more than welcome to add water to it. You know, I'd certainly, with any whiskey actually, you know, try it first without, whether it's car strength that. 65% or down at 40%, you know, try it first, you know, without uh, water, get the feel, get the taste. And everyone has different realms. You know, some people, it's the more powerful, the, the stronger, the better. They want to be blown away. They want a harsh, coarse sort of feel to it. Others want a more subtle, delicate flavor. Add a few drops of water to any of these whiskeys and it will change it. You know, on the whole, it opens up the bouquet, on, particularly on the nose, it really open it up. Sometimes the alcohol binds together at a higher strength uh, on the nose and you add a few drops of water, really opens it up. But also on the palate, you know, add a few drops, experiment, find where your sort of, I guess, best taste is because it's, it's really not for everyone, car strength whiskey. And, and sometimes, you know, the better the whiskey almost, the more water you can add to it because the, the taste and the character remains in there. You know, uh, when we release a new release, often you add a load of water, reduce it down to maybe... 20% strength because then you can really sh feel the off notes or the harshness in the spirit. And if you add water to a whiskey and it completely disappears, 
you know, we'd be pretty upset if that happened to Kilhoman because that tends to mean there wasn't a lot of character in there in the first place. So, you know, feel free to add a few drops and see what, what fits with you. I think probably perhaps, I was going to say that the, the 100% island maybe holds the water a bit better than the others. Um, I think it's probably true. I think, I think I'm more partial to adding water to bourbon maturation than I am to sherry. I, sometimes I feel like if you, you add water to sherry, it kind of, I don't know, it sort of makes it a little bit drier. But you yeah. know, I think certainly a couple of drops with 100% Isla, I don't think you'll be, you'll be disappointed. No. And, and uh, you, you may think differently, but I think with this being at 50% alcohol, nine years old, you know, you might, before you taste it, think, well, this is going to be pretty punchy, blow you away. But it, but it really isn't. I think it is that it's a real top of the palate, real light feel that it is. You know, it doesn't hit you in the back and disappear. It's a real light sort of feel to it. Those, as I've mentioned many times, sort of herbaceous feel to it. I think what we're most pleased with across all our range is the long finish and the taste and the character remains with you. It doesn't just, you know, come in at the front of the palate yeah. and die away. It's got a depth of character that really carries through long into the finish. It's a long, clean finish to it, which, which you know, we're delighted with, you know, as a, you know, we don't pretend we've got 25-year-old whiskey, 30-year-old whiskey. You know, we're 14, 15 years old as a distillery. Um, and, you know, we couldn't be happy with where our whiskey is at. Maybe our, we're still figuring out where our best whiskey is. It might be 8, 9, 10. It might be 11, 12, 13. But this is pretty good. That, that's where we think, yeah, that's, yeah, it's not bad. So, yeah. you know, we're, we're still figuring out where our best whiskey is. And some of it's down to the cast we use. So most of the whiskeys you'll try uh, this evening have been, you know, first fill bourbon barrels where we buy from Buffalo Trace, we fill them once. And actually, we only really use the cast twice, occasionally three times, but usually only twice. And then we sell them on afterwards. You can make, I don't know, plant pots or chairs or, or actually we sold them onto gin distilleries or some rum distilleries to mature with our spirit in. But actually, the spirit or the whiskey we're looking to create is a young, fresh, full of character whiskey. We're not really interested in third fill, fourth fill, fifth fill casts where, you know, often maybe the, perhaps the bigger distilleries are using them again and again and again to get the most out they possibly can from the cask. That would create a different whiskey. If you're filling a fourth fill, fifth fill cask, we would have to lay that down for many more years to get the same character in it. And, and we don't want that. We want a young, fresh, full of character whiskey, which is hopefully what we've got here. But it's not a right and wrong answer, though, at the same time. You know, if we wanted to create a, a great 25, 30 year old whiskey, we wouldn't put it in these first or yeah. bourbon barrels because we would almost over mature. So, no right and wrong way. This is just the way we went with it. And, and we think it, yeah, we think it worked out pretty well, anyway. So. Yeah. And if you're reaching the end of your, your ninth edition, then we, we will be releasing a 10th edition this year. Um, that's going to be, I guess, the official launch date will be sometime in, in late September. Early, well, sometime in September, anyway. Early September. Yeah. Somewhere around then. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll let um, you know. <laughs> and uh, I think we, we're going to... The, the next edition is going to have a bit of sh sherry maturation in there as well. I think it's going to be a, a similar age. So, um, yeah. That's going to be coming out in September, and and it'll be a similar style. You know, follow follow the same theme. You know, in, in terms of that general light, fresh, fruity, floral style, but uh, maybe with a bit more richness, a bit more yeah. fruitiness. And as I think I said earlier, the we will now put on uh, non ninth edition, but on the tenth going forward, it, the barley type that was in there, and we're trying to, I guess, give as much information as we possibly can on the San Diego Macchia Bay ones. Actually, there's a, a NFC tag or a QR code on the back where if you tap on that or, or put it in the uh, camera screen, you, you should be able to go to a, a portal which will tell you what cast type were in there, a bit of a video on how it was made, uh, some tasting notes and, and extra things like that. So uh, we're trying to give as much information as we can. And, and on the back of all the bottles actually is the the bottling date. So particularly when Macamé and Sanig, where they're non-age statement whiskies, you can see the bottling date on the back of the bottle. It's printed, it's a laser kind of imprinted so it's, on there. It's sort of, well, I can't think of it. Let's try it. You can kind of see it on the bottom there. So it's, it's a, <laughs> you won't be able to see it. Course, you can't see it. Right? <laughs> but it is on there, I promise. Uh, and that will tell you. So if you're trying Maccabe now or Sanig now in these tasting packs, and you think that tastes different to the, the bottle you've got in your cupboard, I'd go and look at the back of the bottle and, and maybe it was bottled in 2014, 15, 16 or 18. And the 2020 will be different because every year we are increasing the age slightly of what's in the Maccabe and Sanig. It will always be the same uh, cast makeup, so 90% ex bourbon, 10% sherry for the Maccabay, 70% sherry, 30% bourbon for the, the Sané. 
So always the same cast makeup, but the, the cast will slightly evolve, will increase the age slightly. And we're not afraid of that. And I guess some would want the consistency, but we actually quite enjoy that the differences that come through with each batch, each age variation. And, and they'll always be very similar, but there will always be subtle differences at the same time. So I think that's what you can hopefully enjoy with, with those two whiskies, even though there are sort of, I guess, standard bearing whiskies they will always sort of have a subtle difference between them, particularly the San Egg, where the more sherry maturation gives a much wider range of tastes and flavours. And I think my father would say sometimes they're a bit of a nightmare to work with, to be honest, because every sherry cast you get is often wildly different from the last one. So they're much harder to deal with, whereas the bourbon barrels we get have much more consistency to them. Yeah. Uh, there you go. That was good, wasn't it? Yeah, you went on for about five or ten minutes. Sorry, yeah. Sorry. On to you, James. Yeah. I don't want to steal the live mic. No, well, so we often get asked about sort of what we're doing in terms of experimental stuff at, at Kill Home. And, and I should say, if, if you have any questions, please, please fire them in. We're, the more kind of questions you have, the better. Um, and yeah, so we, we are, we're often looking at kind of new things in terms of experimenting with, with yeast varieties, barley varieties, cast types. Um, certainly at the moment, my dad's sort of pet. Um, experimental side is is on the the yeast side of things and and we've been distilling some unpeated kilhoman with um with a, a kerry yeast which is oh gosh we it's a it's a dry yeast which which once it comes through in, in the after the distillation it's very very light floral as well so it's um i tasted some off the still the other day it was almost like almost gin like weirdly i mean that doesn't necessarily get sound good if you're a, you're a big sort of Peter's whiskey fan, but very, very interesting in, in terms of how that will be developing. I just in, a question come in. Know, I was talking. Sorry, sorry. Someone's asking why you have really bad facial hair. <laughs> <laughs> Can you see it? <laughs> see, he's trying to copy me, if you're wondering. He's trying to get a full beard, but he's not quite grown up. I'm doing enough. my best. Yeah. He's trying, bless him. Right. Anyway, I was talking about yeah, the yeast varieties. So the yeast varieties, yeah, is, is one area that we're experimenting with. And then um, cast types is, a, is another. Um, you know, the, the sort of the barley varieties comes around every year, but it, you kind of make your decision once a year, and then that, that's it set. So you're a bit, you're able to be a bit more flexible in terms of changing your mind with yeast and, and other aspects of the production. So um, yeah, I think it's now we're hold on. You're interrupting me again. I was talking about cast types. So the cast types that we're experimenting with at the moment, we've just had a, a batch of a tequila and, and mezcal casts come in, which um, some of them are going to be used for finishing and some of them are going to be used for, for full maturation. And it'll be, be very interesting to see how, how those come along. So if you're not familiar with mezcal, mezcal is like the sort of... Um, it's to tequila what Isla is to, to Scotch whiskey. So it's like a smoky tequila. Um, so I'm particularly interested to see how... Oh, come on. And we're sort of experimenting, on. aren't we, with variations. So we're sort of learning as we go. And like I think everything at Cologne, we're, we're sort of experimenting and, and learning as we go, really. You know, even with the malting process, we started with two tons. We, you know, effectively weren't doing it very well. You know, we were nine, losing almost 80, 90 litres per tonne compared to the commercial malt with how we're malting. So we learned with that. And, and same thing with all, as James mentioned, with the yeast varieties, with the barley varieties. We're always learning at the moment. We're only 14 years old compared to or 15 years old compared to some series we've been going for 200 years. So we're, we won't pretend that we know everything yet. And I think that's the beauty of it. We're, we're still learning. And um, and even with the cast that we're releasing, you know, early on we released mostly ex bourbon, but the Lock Gorm, which uh, Jason will talk about in a moment, is uh, a release that we did as a, as a very small part, really, of our, our range at the early stages. But it's slowly become a bit of a bigger part as we've gone forward. We filled more sherry cast because it worked very well. You know, the smoke and the sherry, perhaps because it's a lighter, fruitier smoke that we provide that work well with the ex-sherry cast and, and the Oloroso sherry lot form has become a, a bigger part of what we do. So we, we, as I said, we're still learning as we go and um, and James and I will talk a bit more about lot gorm. I'll quickly see if there's any so questions come through. Lot gorm. Um, um, so there's a quick, sorry, just a couple of yeah, questions yeah. there. So the Maccabay and San each doesn't get older each year. It does, it's, it's a very much edging up of age. So at the moment it's averaging around five years of age. Um, it's not going to jump to six, seven, eight, eight each year, but what we're saying each year, we put a few older casts into the batting because uh, we're slowly edging the age up. And we think somewhere when it gets to maybe eight or nine years, that will be where it finishes. That will be maybe where it's at its peak. We're not quite sure yet. 
but it will definitely edge up in age each year. That, that's what it means. So check the age of it. And um, the batch number as well, someone's asked about the 19104 for the ninth edition. And that really means that 19 basically it was bottled in 2019 and 104 is just the batch code we give it uh, on, on the number. Maccabay will have the same thing. They'll have different batch codes on each one and, that, and that's so, what that is. So this one, for example, is, is 20... 136, and so that relates to the exact batch. So the Maccabay or, or Sané, they're, generally speaking, they're, they're batched in sort of 30 or 60 class batches. So that relates to that specific batch that, that's put together. Yeah. Uh, and there's a question on how many yeast varieties we use. We actually mainly use uh, Maori yeast. So it's, it's basically a, a distiller's yeast that we use, and, and that's worked really well for us because we do – Generally speaking, across Scotland, it's probably 50, 60, 70 hours fermentation is, is sort of the peak almost, whereas we go sort of 80 to 90 hours on average for our fermentation. So quite a long time to try and really extract as many esters, lactic acid, get a real fruity side through on the whiskey as much as possible. And the Maori yeast has really worked well for that. We have experimented, as Jay said, with Kerry and other yeast, but they've never quite given the the balance. They tend to go too far in, in yeah. one direction. The, the Maori gives a nice balance between that that earthy, classic, isla sort of grounding almost, um, whilst also allowing that citrus to come through. Whereas, you know, recently with, with the Kerry stuff, um, whilst it's very interesting to, to taste it, I don't taste it and think, well, that, that's kill home. Yeah. You know, I think it, it, Just it's, it's yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I think that's, that's where we are. And, and we, so until we find something, I guess, that we think is a better balance or gives a Full of flavor or something, we won't change from that. We're definitely again still experiment, we'll still do small batches releases of different yeast types because it is interesting. But but Maori yeast has, has been our sort of go to and 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 since since day one really, and we've stuck with it. Lock on, yeah, I think so. Lock on, um, you can see the bottle. It's, it's the um, this is a similar to, to the 100 Isla, it's a, a release that we do every year. So this is. Um, typically released every sort of springtime, maybe April, March, April time. And it's normally around about 15,000 bottles that we release um, all around the world. We, um, we allocate it out because it's in quite high demand. So it, it tends to sell through quite quickly. And um, it's fully matured in sherry cars. So similar style to Sané, you know, the second one we tasted. But there are a few subtle differences Firstly, this is it's full maturation in, in sherry, so there's no bourbon influence whatsoever. And also, this is matured in, in Oloroso sherry butts, so slightly bigger butts, sorry, bigger casts. <laughs> bigger casts. Big and, <laughs> and they've been used to mature sherry for, for a little bit longer, so they don't tend to have so much sort of oaky tannin influence on, on the whiskey. Um, so really, for me, the, the key difference between, or the, the thing that sets lot gone apart is the is a real sort of juicy, fruity, um, slightly rich, slightly spicy, but really full fruity um, character that comes through with the um, with the lot gone. And this is a combination of, of 2007, 2008, 9 and 11 year old casts. So we, we use a quite a, a broad sort of range of, of casts over over a range of years. The, the truth to that is that we don't have a lot of these casts um, from those older years to draw on. So we, we spread them out over those years and, and this whiskey ranges from sort of around about nine to around about 13 years old. Yeah. Um, and some of some of our oldest cars, so yeah. actually 2006, seven, eight, you know, we really don't have many, or also sherry butts at all. So it's some of those oldest cars, and James mentioned the sherry butts, which are bigger, and it's just that, yeah, slower, more integrated maturation you get where Hulk says small cars are sort of a, Almost a flash in the pan. We use crazy finishing. You know, it, it's darker, even. You know, you look at the the Macabre, sorry, the, the San Egg, and then you look at the the Loch Gorm. Loch Gorm's older, but it's actually a slightly lighter color. Yeah, and that's the hogsheads that we use in San Egg, which tend to give it a an almost a bit of a zap, you know, a bit of a great finish to it, a bit of a different influence. Whereas with Loch Gorm, what we wanted was that slower integration, really depth of flavor, which you get here coming through on, on, on the whiskey. And we paired this with the um, with the salami. And the reason for that is the chorizo is a little bit spicier um, and the salami has just got a real sort of juicy um, kind of meatiness to it. It's, it's not so dry. It's, it's got a little bit more uh, moisture to it. And I think that lends itself more to 
to Lockgorm where where as I said it's got that much more of a sort of it's dried fruit, but it, it's kind of you know the the juiciness still still comes through. Mm. I think it's a sort of soft, soft, rich. Got a big mouthful. <laughs> I didn't do much. I didn't do much. But I think this psalm is is probably one of my favourites from the lineup. No, it's got a little bit of spice to it. Still has a little bit of a kick from uh, from it, but it's that real rich flavour. I think venison particularly has such a a big flavour to it. It is a, an earthy, bold flavour. I think if you're going to pair some with Kilhoman, and where it is a quite a flavoursome whiskey, it's big, it's bold, it's got that smoke to it. You need something with a lot of taste as well, and that's where these work so well. The chorizo, the salami, the venison, it just has a lot of flavour to it and, it, and it really complements each other well. I think on paper, if you'd said to me, you know, pair pair these up, I probably would have put the, the lock all with maybe, with certainly with one of the chorizos, because I... I would have thought, you know, that that big spicy character would pair up well with the with the lock But actually, this works works. I think this almost works the best. I don't want to say that, but yeah, it works no, really, I think really so well. too. It, it's it's that yeah, uh, the rich earthiness with the the heavier, more viscous nature with the sherry. The the bourbon cast maturation tends to be a slightly lighter. This sort of viscousness from the sherry, and I, I think pairs really well. And it, as I said at the start, you know, it's not. Any individual one, feel free to mix and match and see what you think works best because they're all got their individual individual flavour and character to it. And I think someone was asking on the on the messaging there about smoky foods or barbecue or bacon, smoked cheese. And I think the general answer is, you know, go and try anything. To be honest, yeah, but well, it needs to be know. something with a, a big bold flavour that matches the Kilhoman. Because if you have a, a very light cheese or uh, you know bacon that is just you know, simply, you know, not got a lot of flavour to it or something. It won't add to the macabre, they won't complement each other. It needs to be something with a bit of a, a punch to it, like, you know, blue cheese or whatever it might be, or a uh, barbecue well, bacon that you mentioned there, something with a, a bit of a to it that can match well. I think the, the classic pairings with Kilhoman would be seafood. Um, you know, the saltiness of yeah. of any seafood really pairs very well with the, the saltiness that comes through with the with the peating level of Kilhoman. Um, cured meats, cooked meats. Um, and and sort of uh, dried fruits, if you like, um, as well as you know cheeses. But as Pete said, you know the more kind of distinct, um, kind of bold yeah. cheeses would pair pair best. And and part of this, we're gonna we're gonna keep on doing these these tastings. So um, you know, we mentioned earlier that you know the next tasting is going to be with with a with a gear halibut, which um, is a Smoked fish uh, using yeah. Kilhoman casts. Um, so yes, yeah, so it's a cast that we've provided them. So ex Kilhoman casts that they then broken down and use the chips from that that cast to then smoke their their fresh halibut with. So it's sort of Kilhoman smoked halibut effectively. So uh, that should be a really interesting one. Their halibut is the gear halibut is is amazing. And uh, straight after this, we'll put the tasting pack online with all the information about where to get the halibut. Again, they've been very generous and, and given a ten percent discount to. Kilhoman fans, if you put that that code in, and and it's a, again another great pairing, and and you know I don't think there's any limit almost to food. You, you know you can try all sorts of different things, and uh, where traditionally it's been wine, you know I think more and more people are trying whiskey, and, and it's uh, certainly a good thing. I think I think where I think p- food pairing works really well when you have with whiskey anyway, where you have bites. You know I don't think whiskey works particularly well as as a pairing for a, a big meal. You know, people have tried it. Just um, drink a lot of whiskey. With yeah, yeah, you have to, you do. And I think where you have cheeses or, you know, um, cheeses or meats or, or something where, you know, pre-dinner, post-dinner, where you're just having bites and you can pair it quite intense flavours with, with intense flavour uh, of the whiskey, I think it works really well. Um, and I think that's better maybe than the, the football yeah, meat. There's meat a meal. couple of questions here. One about uh, US, which is more... James Mark at the mine asking about distribution and what's happening there with the tariffs and in Albuquerque they're finding it very hard to get hold of Kilhoman um, at the moment. Uh, Albuquerque, yeah, Amber in particular. So yeah. yeah, so so basically in the US we have worked with um, our importers uh, called Impex. They uh, between the two of us we we split basically the cost of the tariffs in the US. So Kilhoman should not be any more expensive on the shelf um, than prior to the tariffs. Obviously, we hope the tariffs go away as soon as possible. Um, and 
you know, you will be able to find your home in it. I can't remember exactly how many states we, we do supply in, but it's in most of the country. It, it's available. Should, since you're looking after the market. Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, if you um, if you would like some specific information about specific states, then please just get in touch through the Kilhoma website, and we'll we'll be able to point you in the right right direction. Uh, and the date for the Halibut live chase, that'll be 6th of August, April, four Thursdays from now anyway. So we'll put it up after tonight and, and four Thursdays from now we'll be doing the same again. Same whiskeys, cool range uh, tasting, uh, but we'll have the, the smoked halibut then for you uh, at that. And it's something we, we look to continue with, I think, you know, you know, even after lockdown or bars and restaurants reopening, you know, we're looking to do a few of these tastings and um, reach as many people as possible because usually our job is mostly revolved around getting on a plane, train, boat, wherever, and heading out to, to see people around the world and talk about Kilhoman and, and spread, I guess, the word of Kilhoman as much as we possibly can. And while that's not possible, we're, we're going to be doing more of these tasting packs. So hopefully you keep tuning in. And I think we're, we're pretty much running out of Instagram time. I think it shuts us off in a, in a couple of minutes. So uh, if there's any more questions or we haven't answered any more any of your questions, we will try to after this yeah on the on the comment feed um we'll be we'll, we'll still be there so we can answer any questions that you have but um yeah i think basically well thanks for, for joining in we've uh, uh enjoyed thanks you to great glenn again the, these and they they're still running their promotion oh yeah so they're so, still doing if you want to if you've liked any of this or as i said they got got uh, jealous of the, the food that's been on the show tonight then i think they're still running their attempts and often put in kilhoman as the uh the code on their website then you'll get 10 percent off all their charcuterie and um it's so yeah we look forward to doing in the future so sign java cheers and uh thanks for joining us have a good night so yeah i've got to get up